Thanks for the invitation to discuss anticoagulation therapies for DVTs. This is a topic that general and invasive cardiologists will encounter both in the outpatient and inpatient settings. So I hope you find this to be a helpful overview. I don't have any relevant disclosures. Here are a few goals I hope to accomplish in the next eight minutes or so. First, what are the new anticoagulants indicated for acute DVT treatment? Second, what are the guidelines for recommended duration of therapy? And finally, what are some selection considerations between the different agents? I thought it might be interesting to start with some historical perspective on how warfarin first became the widespread standardized therapy for DVT treatment. You have to go back to The Lancet in 1960. This was the first randomized trial testing warfarin therapy to placebo. The premise behind this at that time was that there was no standard of care, the cost of heparin and associated bleeding risk was high, and there were disadvantages of using IV injections repeatedly. So in the first 35 patients treated with warfarin versus placebo, they found five deaths from PE in the placebo group and zero in the warfarin group. At this point, they thought it would be unethical to continue randomizing, so they only enrolled patients into the warfarin group and built that sample size up to 54 patients and still saw zero deaths. So this is how warfarin got started 60 years ago, and today we have a number of other agents which are novel anticoagulants. They include dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban. The companies made it easy for us because they all now have an indication for treatment of acute DVT PE. And please keep in mind, I'm only focusing on treatment, not prophylaxis. I don't have time to go through the data for each specific trial, which led to FDA approval for, for these agents, but there was a great meta-analysis here, which groups the randomized controlled trials and observational data for all these agents. Across the board, you see very similar efficacy compared with warfarin. And in terms of bleeding risk, the rates are either comparable or generally superior to warfarin. So this, coupled with the convenience of not checking INRs, providers and patients prefer novel anticoagulants for treatment of acute DVT. That brings us to duration of therapy. If you look at the 2016 CHESS guidelines, duration of therapy is split up into three sections. The first time frame is less than 10 days, known as the initial therapy. This leads into the second time frame, which is for three months and known as long-term therapy. For most patients with acute DVT, at least three months of therapy is the goal. Then there are certain situations, which we'll go over next, where you have to extend therapy beyond three months. And this is known as extended therapy, and sometimes this can mean indefinite therapy. So how long you treat depends on what the inciting event was. If the trigger was provoked, it could be a transient factor like surgery or immobilization. It could be triggered by a more persistent risk factor, but still reversible, like a curable malignancy. Or it could be a persistent risk factor that is irreversible, like an inheritable thrombophilia. All of that impacts your duration of therapy, and it really comes down to what is the recurrent risk rate. If it is transient risk uh, trigger like surgery, the rate of recurrence is really low, less than 1% at one year and about 3% at five years. So three months is the recommended duration of therapy. If it's transient non-surgical, it is an intermediate recurrent risk and still carries a recommended treatment duration of three months. If it is a more uh, persistent trigger, the annualized recurrent rate is extremely high, and therefore treatment is recommended until the underlying condition is cured. And if it is an unprovoked trigger, which also carries a high recurrent risk rate, the treatment duration is indefinite. The anatomical location of the DVT is also very important uh, as it impacts treatment duration, but not on the far end of the spectrum in terms of how long to go out, but at the beginning of the spectrum, meaning do you even need to start initial therapy? If it's a proximal DVT, the answer is easy. You start treatment. And you do this uh, even if the patient is asymptomatic because in this location, the embolic risk is high. If it is a distal DVT, there is some debate because the embolic risk in this location is relatively low, less than half of what it is in the proximal position. So initiating treatment for a distal DVT may be based on some of these factors and should be a patient-centered decision, 
you might consider treatment if there are severe symptoms or if any of these risk factors uh, for extension exist. If there are no symptoms, you might opt for not treating, but doing serial imaging for two weeks looking for any evidence of extension during that time. So like I said, there's a lot of patient preference that comes into play for treating a distal DVT. It's a balance between bleeding risk, cost, patient tolerance for inconveniences of coming in for serial imaging. But the bottom line is that something needs to be done. You either treat or you do surveillance. Doing nothing is not an option. And the reason for that is uh, that 15% of distal DVTs can still extend proximally. So you have to be vigilant about treatment and or follow-up. There are a number of algorithms to help providers decide about continuing anticoagulation after the three-month time point for an unprovoked event using a D-dimer guided strategy. If a patient has their first unprovoked DVT and are at low risk of bleeding, you can use an algorithm such as this, where if the D-dimer is negative, you can stop. If positive, you can continue for an additional month and then recheck. Please keep in mind that these strategies are influenced by age and gender and have mixed supporting data behind its use. I'll end with focusing on some selection considerations between the available agents. And here's one multiple choice question on this issue. Which of the following anticoagulants are approved for use without parental anticoagulation lead-in therapy in patients with DVT? And I'll give you just a few seconds to look at that and come up with an answer. So the answer here is B, rivaroxaban. Only rivaroxaban and apixaban can be used without IV unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin lead-in therapy in patients with VTE. Dabigatran and edoxaban can be initiated after five to 10 days of, of heparin products. This is how the trials were done, and this is the labeling on the package insert. My final slide is on additional selection considerations. If you're treating a patient with malignancy, many will still use low molecular weight heparin since the initial studies using novel agents did not include cancer patients. As I mentioned, if you need to avoid lead-in parental therapy with heparin, then using Riva or Apixaban, um, then use Riva or Apixaban. If your uh, patient uh, prefers a once daily regimen for compliance, then consider Riva or Doxaban. If your patient has a history of dyspepsia or GI bleed, you may want to avoid Dabigatran and consider Warfarin or Apixaban. Uh, patients with very severe renal dysfunction would still need Warfarin therapy. Low molecular weight heparin should be used during pregnancy as other agents have potential to cross the placenta. And finally, cost and coverage can be a big issue, and that may further guide you to using one agent over another for your patient. Thank you so much for your attention.